Greetings and welcome everyone. My name is Terry Loftus and I'm honored to be with you virtually today. I have the pleasure of serving as Assistant Superintendent and Chief Information Officer for the San Diego County Office of Education. Our work is centered on supporting the more than 550,000 K-12 students and staff of San Diego County. Let's begin today by taking a brief look at some statistics regarding the K-12 threat landscape. K-12 organizations experienced a 323% rise in malware attacks in 2022. This according to the 2023 report from cybersecurity vendor SonicWall. According to Fortinet, nearly half of K-12 institutions attacked with ransomware paid the ransom to recover their data, with most receiving some of their data back, though only 2% getting all of their data back. In 2022, the cost for remediation on average was 1.58 million per ransomware attack for schools and districts. In a Forbes interview last month, CIS Director Carlos Cazzi noted, quote, since the end of 2022, we have seen more than a 30% quarter over quarter increase of cyber attacks against K-12 schools. The most recent nationwide cybersecurity review, which is facilitated by the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or MSISAC, illuminates common challenges K-12 leaders are facing. These include 81% noted a lack of sufficient funding. That's something common to all of us. 59% referenced increasing sophistication of threats. And over 47% of participants mentioned a lack of school cybersecurity strategy. Well, what about cybersecurity insurance? One of the recurring conversations my colleagues and I hear is regarding cybersecurity insurance and the question, doesn't that protect our agency? Let's delve into this topic for a moment. As we all know, cybersecurity insurance, like other types of insurance, is a safeguard employed to transfer risk. It doesn't mitigate or diminish the risk, only transferring financial liability. According to the data from Alliant Insurance Services, there are approximately 10 cybersecurity insurance carriers in the United States that serve the majority of the market. All carriers have reported an overwhelming increase in ransomware claims against public entities. The concerns and increasing costs of cybersecurity insurance have spiked as public entities such as K-12 institutions have become mo the most successfully targeted sector in terms of successful penetrations by attackers and frequency. Worse still, public entities are amongst the least prepared for cyber threats due to legacy software, older equipment, which includes endpoint computing devices like laptops and network infrastructure, uh, lack of staffing, lack of training, and meager K-12 security budgets. Insurance carriers are seeing that cyber risks have increased in sophistication, frequency, and severity of impact, resulting in an increased number of claims and increased cost for individual cyber incident claims. Simply put, cyber insurance is something that your school district or charter school should pursue but know that many carriers are no longer writing new cyber policies, while others have been forced to increase premiums to levels that some schools simply cannot afford. To be clear, even in the best of circumstances, we see that insurance carriers have radically increased the requirements outlined in their cyber policies. Most now mandate multi-factor authentication, endpoint detection and response, and training programs to be in place. Nearly all have software lifecycle expectations, which might be the most daunting policy requirement. Think for a moment about the software and applications used in your school district. Think about operating systems, financial software, HR software, transportation systems, and many hundreds of applications used instructionally on student and teacher Chromebooks, iPads, and laptops. The likelihood is that many of these applications may be out of date to one degree or another. Did you know that the insurance carrier could deny payment on a claim due to having old, outdated, or unpatched software? This is now the reality for current insurance policies. The more pressing concerns that cybersecurity insurance simply cannot address are the non-financial harms to educational agencies, to our K-12 staff members, to our precious students, and to the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. For the next few minutes, we're going to walk through a scenario together where you are the superintendent of your school district. I can't see each of you, but raise your hand if you're a superintendent or have superintendent in your title, such as assistant, associate, or deputy superintendent. Good. Now, those of you attending today who are not superintendents, raise your hands as well because, congratulations, you've just been fictionally promoted to superintendent for the next few minutes. Kidding aside, please be earnest as we walk through this scenario. Think about what it would be like 
to be responsible for the care and the well-being of your staff members and the students your district or charter school serves. Let's begin on a Monday where you've just arrived at your office. You've had a refreshing weekend and you're full of energy, probably full of coffee as well, for the work ahead. Shortly after arriving at the office, you receive a call from your director of IT, noting that there's a problem and that she and her tech team are looking into reports of district systems and software that's not responsive this morning. Most pressing is the director of transportation who urgently reached out to alert everyone that the district's bus routing system is down and inaccessible. While the bus drivers and dispatcher are highly capable and experienced, no active routing uh, software means that only known regular pickups and drop-offs can take place today. As a superintendent, you know the transportation is highly fluid system and student and family needs sometimes changing by the day. Your CBO hurries into your office who has been coordinating with transportation and notes that messaging must be sent to parents and to students regarding the impacts. Clearly, students cannot be left at stops or dropped off at incorrect locations, which will happen if the outage continues. As your Monday progresses, the news uh, of inaccessible systems is getting worse, with platforms like food services being in inaccessible. The following day, it becomes apparent that this is a ransomware attack, and you contact law enforcement as a ransom request for $5 million U.S. million is made. Very little information is still available other than the confirmation from your staff that data on various important servers does indeed appear to be encrypted and inaccessible. You seek out guidance from superintendent colleagues who respond that they've never, thankfully, encountered a scenario like this one. You seek guidance from local law enforcement who will likely discourage paying the ransom. The high level view, of course, is to not fund criminals who might ultimately use this money to finance other malicious and or illegal activities that may bring further harm to others. The data also shows that while some attackers will provide the decryption keys if paid, it's not a certainty. And in fact, there have been some situations where the attackers ask for more money after receiving the initial payment. Lastly, there is no guarantees that paying the ransom will keep sensitive data safe, as it's commonly unclear at least at the beginning of an incident investigation, that data has even been exfiltrated. So, what would you do? Ultimately, let's hypothetically say that you work with your board of trustees and determine that the district will not pay the ransom. Your IT staff, working in concert with cybersecurity insurance consultants, note that they believe that most of the encrypted data can be restored from backups, which itself is a win that many educational agencies cannot currently assert, by the way. Frustrated by a lack of payment, the threat actor sends malicious messages to staff and parents noting their sensitive data will be published online if the district doesn't pay. This increases the number of concern calls from parents to schools, directly to some teachers, and to the central office. A short time later, you learn from law enforcement that highly sensitive information on the children your district serves and your staff, including teachers, counselors, principals, custodians, and others, has been published to the internet by attackers. This is approximately 100 gigabytes of data spanning over 100,000 students, staff, and community members that's now publicly available. Sadly, this isn't just benign information, but also highly sensitive information, such as social security numbers of your staff and other personally identifiable information, commonly called PII as well as names, birth dates, and discipline records, and other sensitive information on students. Sitting in the conference room, now serving as an emergency operations center for your cabinet members, you take a call on the speakerphone uh, with one of your district's special education teachers, who clearly is in tears. She shares that she's just learned about some of her students' IEPs, or Individualized Education Programs, being seen online. She tells you that the exposure of the students' names, addresses, their disabilities, their medications, and their highly confidential testing and evaluation results. She has spoken to one of the parents and all involved are traumatized. Another staff member in your district, a school psychologist, who has just heard that sensitive notes from a student who had reported physical abuse at home are also public. He is worried about the safety of this student. This scenario could go on and on as all of these things have already happened in our nation's schools. We need to put aside the movie depictions of hackers and clever computer heists. The painful reality can be far worse and one that we must work together to combat. 
Many K-12 leaders are learning that cybersecurity in attacks impact individuals' most sensitive information, and in turn, how these attacks harm the most sensitive in our care. The impacts are not just financial, though those can be significant as well. As we take stock of our organization's cyber hygiene, it's important to know what we are protecting. Thousands of data points are collected on students, many of which are sensitive or confidential. These data inform districts and schools on how to best serve their students, but this also includes information such as full names, date and place of birth, gender, socioeconomic status, and medical data such as allergies, medications and dosage, health history and immunization records. The list continues as we consider discipline records, disabilities and accommodations, special education enrollment, student mental health assessments, physical fitness tests, and much more. We have yet to touch on the vast financial and legal data, as well as staff and community information. Now, everyone can take a deep breath. We are going to take the information and emotions of those real world scenarios and focus them on what actions we can collectively take. We will also discuss some of the resources that are available and review best practices. So let's roll up our sleeves or maybe just sit up a little straighter in that chair as you work from home in sweatpants and flip-flops. As someone who has worked in both private and public sectors, it's important to acknowledge that in K-12 education, we have a superpower, a strategic advantage, if you will. That is the ability to collaborate. To one degree or another, all of our institutions are publicly funded. And as such, we don't need to each be reinventing the wheel. We don't need to keep best practices from each other as some form of profitable intellectual property, as happens amongst competitors in the private sector. We are truly better together. First up, we all need a plan of action. It's critically important that our institutions adopt a strategy and a framework to address risks in an effective and efficient manner. There are many free quality frameworks available to K-12 agencies. In California, my colleagues and I have championed the adoption of the CIS Critical Security Controls Framework, which was published by the MSISAC and the Center for Internet Security. The CIS controls are a prescriptive, prioritized, and simplified set of best practices and safeguards that you can use to strengthen your cybersecurity posture. Better yet, the CIS controls have been crafted to meet the needs of organizations of various types and sizes. Controls are broken down into implementation groups, which provide excellent guidance regardless of whether your organization is a charter school with 80 students or a large district with 100,000 plus students. Best of all, this framework is free to K-12 agencies. Second up, you can't manage what you can't or don't measure. In general, K-12 is far from having a clear understanding of the depth and breadth of the risk landscape. One of the greatest opportunities is to self-reflect and assess your own organizations. I'll underscore that K-12 institutions are deeply under-resourced and outmatched when it comes to evolving cybersecurity threats. For example, California has over a thousand public school districts, the vast majority of which have never had any form of comprehensive vulnerability assessment. The reality is that most K-12 institutions simply don't know if they've had an incident unless it's made visible by the threat actor, such as in the case of a ransom demand. CISA has been providing free assessments to K-12 entities in recent years, and in August, committed to providing tailored assessments, facilitating exercises, and delivering cybersecurity training for 300 new K-12 entities in the current school year. MSISAC offers low-cost vulnerability assessment services, and depending on your state or jurisdiction, you may have external assessment resources available as well. Additionally, MSISAC offers the Nationwide Cybersecurity Review, or NCSR. This is a no-cost, anonymous, annual self-assessment that educational agencies can complete on their own. Taking the next step, implementing solutions. Now that you've completed one or more of the assessments and have a cybersecurity framework to utilize as a roadmap, how do we begin or expand the work of improving our data security? First, a reminder to not overlook local resources. I have met an array of talented and compassionate IT leaders who work in K-12 and uh, that includes women and men who work at regional and state level agencies. For example, I serve at a county office of education in California with each of our 58 counties having a similar office. This is also true in most states in the nation. 
They may be called educational service centers or regional support centers, but regardless of their designation, we are here to help and support local school districts and charter schools. Now, pivoting to federal help and support. I would strongly encourage any organization of any type to implement multi-factor authentication as soon as possible. Director Easterly and CISA have long advocated implementing MFA and its security benefits. Identity and access management is commonly at the core of most attacks, and MFA may be the single most powerful safeguard you can put into place in your school district. Be sure to visit their website at www.cisa.gov MFA for more resources. Another free resource is available to K-12 agencies from MSISAC. It's called the Malicious Domain Blocking and Reporting Service, or MDBR. This is a DNS-based web security solution that provides an additional layer of cybersecurity protection that is proven, effective, and easy to deploy. One of the services that my organization has started utilizing recently is CISA's Cyber Hygiene Vulnerability Scanning Service, which again is free for K-12 agencies. Once initiated, CISA performs automated vulnerability scans and delivers a weekly report. It's actionable information that is easy to read and just magically lands in your inbox. CISA, the FBI, the National Security Agency, and MSISAC have joined forces to provide the StopRansomware.gov website, which is filled with guidance and resources on, you guessed it, ransomware. Recently, the U.S. Department of Education and CISA jointly released a document called K-12 Digital Infrastructure Brief, Defensible and Resilient. This is part of a series of guidance to assist educational leaders in building and sustaining core digital infrastructure for learning. Department of Ed staff like Michael Klein and Christina Ishmael are leading the charge to curate and develop beneficial resources like these for schools across the nation. These resources are only a few of what's currently available or being developed from our federal partners. Those of us in K-12 know that support has been a long time coming. In fact, for those IT staff attending today, you know that a decade ago, our cybersecurity work sounded a bit like a synopsis from a 1980s blockbuster action movie, such as, with little or no assistance from others, John McClane is required to thwart the elaborate plans of a group of like-minded villains because no one else is in a position to do so. And much like the protagonist of this movie, IT staff have been doing incredible work against the odds. Thankfully, support is now on the way. On the point of support, I had the honor of recently being invited to the White House, where Dr. Jill Biden hosted the first Summit on Cybersecurity for K-12 Schools, which really shined a spotlight on this very topic. It's clear that our federal partners are now making the K-12 sector a priority. DHS, CISA, the FBI, and the U.S. Department of Education publicly committing to work more collaboratively moving forward with each other and with K-12 institutions in addressing the increasing and evolving cybersecurity threats we face. The final bright spot I'll leave you with is one regarding long overdue funding support. At the White House event, the FCC reiterated Chairwoman Rosenworcel's efforts to work on E-rate and highlighted the upcoming $200 million cybersecurity funding pilot specifically for K-12. The way forward is clear, K-12 school districts, charter schools, county offices, regional service centers, and state-level agencies must continue to innovate and evolve best practices while concurrently building more robust and powerful partnerships between K-12 entities, the United States Department of Education, and other state and federal partners. Thank you.